prayer for them, or if you need, if you want, all you can do is just call their name out, and uh, God knows the exact things that they need, so I'm going to just ask you to do that as we pray. Our Father in heaven, right now we lift up to you these men and women who serve you all around the world. Father, we lift up to you these and many others who serve you all across our world. Father, we pray that you would bring your blessing upon them. Father, I pray that even today that they would just recognize that through your presence that somebody lifted them up in prayer. Father, I pray that you would give them strength as they serve you, give them boldness as they witness for you. Father, also we pray for your protection upon them as they travel from place to place and many of them serve in, in dangerous and remote areas. Father, we just pray again for your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say a special thank you. I don't know if you hope you enjoyed our youth uh, praise band this morning. You know, they just, every time they get better and better, uh, it's exciting to see that. I, you know, I'm going to tell you this. We're going to talk a little bit later about practice and, and how practice improves us. Well, you know what's going to happen about 3 o'clock? I think it's at 3 o'clock, right? About 3 o'clock this afternoon, while many of you are doing what I would probably be doing, which is taking a nap, um, at 3 o'clock today, that group that was up here at the first, they're going to be here right back at the same place with their instruments, practicing, getting better, working on their craft. They've gotten better. Why? Because they put in the time to practice. And so I want to say a special thank you. Y'all are doing a great job. Really I'm impressive to see how much you keep improving. I want to say thank you. Uh, Andy is on a trip this week and next week. Uh, next week we have uh, Paul Newberry is going to be back leading us in worship again. Uh, but I want to say a special thank you to Ty for filling in this morning. He does a great job. Uh, did a great job at the 830 service. You know, I told him he picked uh, just perfect songs for the crowd in the 830 service. Uh, and if you want to know exactly what those are, you can ask him. Maybe you might decide that you want to start coming to that 830 service. Uh, but he did a great job there. And, uh, also did a great job did again this morning in our 11 o'clock service. If you've got a Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. As you turn there, I'll tell you a couple of stories. One, uh, both from the first church that I pastored. When I got there, uh, the somebody on the search committee asked me, they said, Grant, do you preach more than just the three good Baptist sermons? Uh, I told this to our crowd on Wednesday night, and I was kind of confused when they asked about the three good Baptist sermons, because I thought there were a lot more good Baptist sermons than the three. And evidently, the pastor before me had pretty much preached three sermons. Didn't matter where he was going from the scripture, but he had three sermons. And those three sermons were, get saved, go get them saved, and give us money so we can go get them saved. And basically, that's what it came down to. That was the entirety of his preaching repertoire. Well, I'm going to tell you, today is really a kind of primarily focused on the second sermon. This is a go get them saved type of message. Uh, so if you have a problem with that, I'm just warning you right up front, that's what it's going to be. Uh, the, uh, you know, as we talk about reading this book, I will. Today is I will go. Before we go, though, we've got to understand something. We've got to understand a power that resides within us as followers of Jesus Christ. Another guy in that church, he was actually on the search committee, he was probably one of the one of them, not the best Bible teacher in the church that I served at, at first. Great guy, incredibly moral. I mean, he just, everything about this guy, you look at and you would respect. Was raising his grandson. Uh, every decision he would make, you would never question because you just knew morally, ethically, this guy was as solid as it gets. Great student of the Bible, studied the Bible a lot. So one day he comes up to me and he says, you know, he said, Pastor Graham, I said, I, I got to tell you. He said, I, I believe in the Trinity. 
And you know, my first thought was, okay, that's good. You're a deacon. You're, you know, one of our best Bible teachers. I'm really glad you believe in the Trinity. He said, I, I understand God the Father. I understand, you know, His role and everything. It's like, okay, I'm going to get him to think, where on earth is he going with this? And he said, I understand the Son, you know, dying on the cross and, and all of that stuff, the resurrection. I understand all that, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm really getting nervous by this time. He said, but I just really don't understand the role of the Holy Spirit in my life. And, and I just kind of stopped and looked at him, and I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, well, he said, I know the beginning, you know, when you become a Christian, the role of the Holy Spirit to, to make that work in you. He said, but I just really, on a day-to-day -day basis, I just really don't see a need for the Holy Spirit in my life. And I sat there confused and thinking, what on earth? This guy is so off. And then I started thinking about his life. And you know what? I don't really know that he needs the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, y'all might think, you're probably thinking, my gosh, our pastor is horrendous, a heretic. Don't worry, I'm not. <laughs> Let me explain it. For this guy, he was retired. He had done well in his life. Had plenty of money. So it wasn't like he had to rely on the Holy Spirit to provide money for him to feed his wife and himself and his grandson. Wasn't sick. Had no illnesses. Health, good. He was as honest and as ethical just because he had been taught from birth to be honest. And so when a question of what should I do came up, he really didn't have to rely on the Holy Spirit to get him through it. Because he could simply rely on what he had been taught and make decisions. Well, I got this guy and I invited him because he loved to study the Bible. We were doing this thing called faith evangelism training. And I invited him to become part of the first team that we were putting together. Now, as I look back, I think that I kind of tricked him a little bit. Because I explained to him that we were going to meet every week, and we were going to take an hour, and that we were going to be studying the scriptures together for an hour. I think I forgot to tell him that, oh yeah, when we finish studying the scriptures together for an hour, we're going to go out and we're going to make visits and we're going to go talk to people about Jesus Christ. I think I kind of forgot to tell him that because he was all excited about coming and studying together. And so we get in and we start studying and then I spring it on him, you know, hey, listen, after we finish this, we're going out and we're going to make visits. And his eyes kind of got wide and he was like, okay. So we went on our first visit, you know, the first couple of visits, they didn't know the the formula that we used in faith to, to share the gospel. And so I said, you know, hey, the first few visits, don't worry. I'll lead all the way through. You know, y'all can talk at the beginning when we get to what we call the key question, which is, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? I said, when we get to that, I'll ask the question. I said, I'll take it from there. Okay, so we go the first couple of ones, great visits, nothing big happens. Well, then they were starting to learn the gospel presentation. And we get to the point, and they had learned a couple of parts of it, didn't know the whole thing. And so that night, I said, you know, hey, tell you what, when we go make our visit tonight, I'm going to have you ask the key question, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? And then I'm going to just have you go ahead and start into the gospel presentation and start presenting the gospel. And he's kind of looking at me and go, okay. So we go make this visit. And, and it, the, I mean, it is God appointed. Because of another couple of times that we had visited, they are people that had come to our church, they were already believers. When we asked them the key question, they gave you the perfect right answer. You know, it's through Jesus Christ, forgive us of our sins. So he asked the key question. And this guy throws something out, and you know, it took me a minute to kind of picture all the stuff this guy's saying and finally figure out, okay, he is not a believer. And I'm thinking, what is not what he's gonna do now? And so this guy who did not understand the role of the Holy Spirit in his life, begins to start talking. And he starts in on the gospel presentation. And he only knew that the whole thing is divided out into each letter of the word faith means something. He starts in on F, which he had learned, does great. He gets to A, which he has learned, and he does great. He does not know I, T, and H. And he just keeps going. And I am listening to him, and I'm just like, did you read ahead? Because he is, I mean, he is knocking it out of the park all the way through. And I'm thinking, 
what is going on? Well, at the end of that, the guy that we were sharing the gospel with gets down to the end and a friend says, would you like to pray and receive Jesus right now? And this guy says, yes, I would. He prayed and he became a Christian. If we got back into the, the car that night to head back to the church, he looked at me and he said, you remember that conversation we had about me not understanding the role of the Holy Spirit in my life? I said, yeah. He goes, scratch that. <laughs> he said, I now know one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit in my life. He said, Grant, he said, if you ask me to go through all of that again right now, he said, there's no way I could do it. He said, I don't know how. He goes, I was talking and things were coming out of my mouth and part of my brain was going, you don't know that. <laughs> he said, you're right. The Holy Spirit's got an important role in our life. I want to tell you, if you do not understand the role, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, you are missing out on the best things in life. We're going to talk today about the power to go. If you've got a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus is talking right before he is ascended to the Father. And he looks to the disciples and he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. First thing we've got to understand is that we have to receive the power. At Pentecost, that was the advent of the Spirit upon all believers. Prior to Pentecost and throughout the Old Testament, you would have times where the Bible would say that the Spirit came upon a person. It's interesting because it always talks about the Spirit coming upon a person, never talks about the Spirit indwelling a person. And it would talk about it, what would happen is for a specific purpose. A specific objective, something that was about to happen, the Spirit would come upon a person, would empower the person to do whatever it is, whatever task it is that God had called them to do. They would accomplish that task, and then the Spirit would come off of that person. It wasn't that the person lost their salvation or anything like that. It was that in, during that time, the Spirit came upon a person, gave them the power to accomplish whatever it was that they were supposed to accomplish, and then the Spirit would leave that person. But at the time of Pentecost, the Spirit comes upon us, and now the Spirit resides within us. And there is a huge difference, because the Spirit does not leave you and I. The Spirit doesn't come on us to accomplish some objective, and then we lose the Spirit. When we become a follower of Jesus Christ, you and I are indwelt. And it was at Pentecost when that began, that the Spirit indwelt a person and became a part of our life. When you make the decision to follow Jesus, the Spirit indwells you. The Spirit now has become a part of who you are. And you have, we would say, received the power of the Holy Spirit. But once we've received the power of the Holy Spirit, something needs to happen. And that is that we need to learn to utilize the power of the Spirit. Now, as I say, when we need to utilize the power of the Spirit, I want, to understand, I want you to understand, I don't mean anything selfish. Many times when we talk about utilizing something, we get this idea of utilizing it for my own good. You know, if, if I'm going to, to utilize a tool, I, typically I'm going to utilize a tool to accomplish something for me. When I'm talking about utilizing the power of the Spirit, I'm not talking about utilizing it to accomplish something for me, but it's utilizing it to accomplish something for God. It is taking what is already within us and learning how to to work and learning how to listen to the power of the Spirit, learning how to use it to do the things that God has called us to do. For Peter and the apostles, the power coming into their life was instantaneous. It happened like that. They were praying. They were doing just what Jesus had told them to do. They gathered. They're praying. And as they pray, the, the scriptures say that tongues of fire came and, and landed on each one of them. And for them, that was the time when the power came on them. You know, if you look at their life after Jesus died, at his, at his death, the apostles are scattered. They're terrified. They're scared. The fear, fear is running through them. And then after the resurrection, you know, we would think that, okay, well, at the, at the resurrection, now all of a sudden they see that, hey, we can beat death. You would think that they would be fearless after that, but they still weren't. 
They still were hiding and cowering in rooms. It wasn't until the Spirit came on their life that the, the, the apostles went from being scared to being fearless. When the power of the Spirit came into them, those men went from not being willing to stand up for Jesus to now, no matter what, they would stand and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. When the Sanhedrin said to them, to speak no more in this name, and if you do, we're going to beat you and we're going to do other things to you, the apostles would look at them and go, go right ahead. We're going to keep on preaching. We don't care what you do to us. We're going to keep on going. They went from being terrified to being fearless. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. But you and I live today and we look around and sometimes I think we begin to go, you know, in Acts, man, all those great miracles. All these people were, were healed, they couldn't talk, and now they can talk, they couldn't hear, they couldn't see. And we see all of these miracles and we begin to look around us and we go, you know, sometimes I just don't know if we see those miracles. And yes, I know we've prayed for people and we've seen people that had cancer that be healed. And, but sometimes I think we just kind of get this idea that, well, there's not these great miracles happening around us. But I want to tell you what the greatest miracle is. The greatest miracle is when one person experiences life change. When one family is restored, when a marriage is restored back to health. When, when a person that is doing drugs gets off of drugs because... They wonder because they become a follower of Jesus Christ and they realize they don't want that garbage in their bodies anymore. When God changes lives, that is the greatest miracle. But folks, that miracle is far greater than somebody that has cancer not having cancer anymore. When a person's life is changed, when their eternal destiny is changed from going to hell to going to heaven, there is no greater miracle that will ever happen than that miracle right there. We can say what we want. And we can look around and say, oh, there's not the great miracles. That's garbage. I've seen those waters, I've seen too many people and since I've been here to be baptized to say that great miracles are not happening. Miracles happen. And they happen because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And you may say, okay, Grant, that's great. But I don't see any power in my life. Sometimes I think it's because we don't understand how to use the power that resides in us. The same power that went into Peter, James, and John, and all the other apostles, that same power comes into you and I. The exact same one. We need to learn how to use it. And so how do you learn to use it? Well, the first step you got to make sure it's in you. You've got to come to a point where you recognize that you're a sinner. And that you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins because of what he did on the cross, his death for you, to ask to be forgiven of your sins, the cleanse of those. That's the first step. But even when we take the first step, then we got to start practicing. We practice the presence of God in our life. And here's how you do it. One, is you take this book, you take your Bible, and you spend some time with it every day. You take your Bible every day, and you begin to read it. And you read. And when we read a passage of Scripture, sometimes people say, boy, I, you know, I love to read, but I just don't know how to get anything from what I read in the Scripture. Well, let me give you a very simple one. I told you this before, and I will tell you this again. As long as you have me as your pastor, you're going to hear this on occasion. There's three questions that I ask when I read the scripture. My son is down here going, I know the three questions. The first one is, what? When you read a passage of scripture, very simply ask yourself, what is this saying? It's not a hard question. It is, I read a passage and I say, what does this tell me? Basically what I want you to do when you read it is to take the passage, put it into your own words. Don't use the words that are here, but put it into your own words. Paraphrase it into your mind. What's it saying? What's the message here? Then the second question is, so what? So what difference does it make? So what is the importance of this? When I read a passage of Scripture, it's great if it tells me something and I can explain it back to myself. 
But if I don't understand what's the importance of it, I'm never going to be able to add it to my life. And so I ask that question, so what? So what's important about this? Which leads me to the third, now what? Now what is when I take the step and I say, now what do I need to do different in my life? Is there something in my life that I need to remove? Is there something in my life that I need to add? Is there something that I need to change in how I do things? Is there an attitude that I need to fix? So I begin to read the scriptures and I say, what does it say? So what is the importance of it? Now what do I do with this? That is one of the steps of beginning to practice the power and to utilize the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to learn more about who He is. And the only way you're going to learn more about who He is is by reading this book called the Bible. Second thing we can do is to spend time in prayer. And when I'm talking about prayer, I am not just talking about taking out my laundry list. And, and I call it my laundry list. You know, my list of everything that I want God to do for me and everybody I want God to heal and, and all of the different things that I think God needs to take care of and take that out and say, okay, God, are you ready? Number one, and you just go through my list, you know, boom, 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 I hit all my things, and then I say, God, thanks for listening. We'll check in until you next time. For some of us, I think that's what we think of in prayer, is that we get our list, we go through our list, we say, thanks, God, for listening. Appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Okay, that's a part of prayer is telling God what we need to tell him. But it's not all a prayer. We need to learn to listen. Because prayer is communication between us and God. Well, if it's just me telling you stuff, is that communication? No. Communication is when it goes back and forth. And so we have to learn to listen. We've got to learn to be quiet. To tell God what we need to tell Him. But also to spend the time to just listen to what He has to say to us. <clears throat> that takes practice. Trust me, you're not going to be a pro at it overnight. And even the professionals practice. Right now it's baseball season. And I don't know a number of you are big Texas Ranger fans. You know, before the Texas Rangers come to Arlington and play at Globe Life Park, I hope that's the name of the park. I got to think, nobody told me to get correct me after the, okay, good, thank you. When they come to Globe Life Park, they don't just show up one day and say, all right, time to start the season. I've let all the fans in. We're going to fill the stands up. And all 11 of us that are going to play, we're ready. Let's go. They don't do that, right? No, what do they do? They go to Arizona. And they spend a month or more practicing every day. These are guys who are paid millions of dollars to hit this little white baseball and pick it up and throw it to each other. Millions of dollars to do this. And what do they do? They come and they practice every day. You know what's amazing is the fact that, that those guys, the hitters, the guys that are some of the best hitters in the world will take time in which they take a baseball tee. You know, the same type of thing that your little five-year-old plays on. They take that and they set it at home plate and they get their bat and they go through the process of hitting a baseball off of a tee. These are the best in the world. And they're going back to the very basics of getting my stance right, getting the step right, getting the swing right on a tee. That's the base foundation of hitting a ball. And they practice it. And they practice it. And because they have poured all of those hours into practicing, they got better and better and better. They didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a professional baseball player and go down to the Rangers and say, here I am, put me in. <coughs> Folks, the same way, we need to learn how the Spirit works in our life. We need to learn how the Spirit speaks. One of the ways you can learn how the Spirit speaks is by talking to other believers. Talking to those that you know have progressed and have practiced the presence of Christ in their life for many years. Talk to them. Find out how God works in their life. Listen to what he, how He speaks to them. But then also, you have got to learn how it happens in your life. Because the way God is going to talk to you is probably going to be a little different than He talks to me. 
Every one of us is going to be a little bit different. And we've got to learn and we've got to practice. If you want to be able to utilize the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you've got to practice it. It doesn't happen automatically. Yes, there is some power of the Holy Spirit that does. But to be able to really learn to hear when He's challenging us and when He's pushing us, you and I have got to practice. The worship, the youth band that was up here, they've gotten a lot better, as we said earlier. Why have they gotten better? Because every Sunday they're up here practicing. They're putting in the time. They're making themselves better. If we want to be able to hear and utilize the power of the Spirit in our lives, you and I have got to practice His presence. And once we have practiced it, we need to understand how to go. Go in the power. Not on our own, but in the power. We are commanded to be a part of sharing the message of Jesus with the entire world. But we are to start with our local community. You notice in this passage, Jesus says, In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost ends of the earth. How would, if he was speaking right here, if Jesus was standing right here and giving to you Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he would say, start in Sanger, and Texas, and Oklahoma, and the ends of the earth. He would tell us to start where we are. You and I need to start where we are. But that's more, that's scary. It's scarier to start sharing the message of Jesus across the street than it is 2,000 miles away. Why is it scarier? Because the person across the street knows you. I was going to mow my yard yesterday. Got the weed eater, brought a brand new weed eater, got it out. It works perfect. It's a little heavy, but you know, maybe that's just as I'm getting old. Got, it, got all the weed eating done, finished that up. Time to get the mower out. Well, I had been given a mower. And then I was so excited, you know, this mower cost me nothing. I get it out, I'm cranking on it, I'm cranking on it, and it does not start. And so I'm looking at it, you know, and I fiddle with some things, try to get some things going, it still doesn't start. Pretty soon, I'm down, ready to start kicking the lawnmower. And, you know, if I wasn't the pastor and knew that people around me might be watching, I probably would have said some things to the lawnmower. <laughs> Why is it scarier to start where you are? Because those people across the street might see you when you're out there kicking your lawnmower and calling it some French words. <laughs> it's scarier to start at home because those people know us. They see us when we go to the football game and scream at the coach. They see us when we go to the basketball game and yell at the refs. They see us when we go to the grocery store and we're rude to the checkout, to the cashier. They see how we treat our children. They see how we drive our car. It's scarier to start at home because those are the people that know us. That's where Jesus tells us to start. And you and I should start right at home. Start across the street. Start with the person that works in the cubicle next to us. Start with the people that we come into contact with. That's where Jesus said to start. And yes, it is wonderful, and we need to continue to go to the uttermost ends of the earth. I am so excited to hear that then pretty soon our missions committee is going to be bringing back a recommendation about partnering probably with a mission organization in Honduras and doing some work down there. I am excited about that. I can't wait for my opportunity to be able to go to Honduras. I'm excited about the trip that we just took. A bunch of people went down to Mexico and Matamoros and served there. We need to continue to do that. We need to continue to go to other places. But we need to also start at home. And we need to start across the street. We need to start in our office building with the person that works next to us. You may say, okay, Grant, that's great. I know I need to go. But I, I, I don't know what to say. Yes, you do. Some of you might be able to say, you know, well, I can, I can quote off to you the alphabet soup of how to lead people to Christ. 
And, and I know a bunch of different methods. I mean, I know faith. I know wind, share Jesus now, the Roman road, uh, evangelism explosion. I mean, I, I could name and name and name all of these different ways of sharing people, of sharing a message of hope. You may tell you the most effective. The most effective is to say, there was a time in my life when I didn't have peace or hope. Or there was a time in my life when I faced challenges that I didn't know how to get through them. I didn't know how to make it. Uh, there was a time in my life where I did all of these and you can put in whatever your sins were. There was a time in my life when that characterized who I was. But I met Jesus Christ. And there came this experience in my life when I recognized that I was a sinner. When I recognized that I didn't have hope. When I recognized that I didn't have peace. And that I came before Jesus and I said, you are offering me peace, hope, life, freedom, whatever it is that needed to change in your life. That you are offering me that because I am a sinner and you paid the price for my sin. You're offering me that hope. And so I, and you, and I accepted that gift. And because I accepted that gift and became a follower of Jesus Christ, now I have hope. Now when I face crisis, when I face hardship, when I face life, I have hope. I've got peace. I've got assurance. If you tell the story of what Jesus Christ did in your life, all of the other are great. But what people want to hear is how did Jesus change you? And so if Jesus has changed your life, then you know how to share the gospel. You don't have to get the perfect presentation. You simply need to be able to tell what he did in you. When I was at the training to learn how to do the faith evangelism strategy, we did our training, and then on the last night of the, of the conference, we went out and made visits. We went, and my group went out, we shared the gospel, nothing happened. We came back, one lady got up.